The summer season for Colorado's 14,000 foot, that's 4,300 meter peaks, is in full swing. And the fall expedition season to many of the world's even higher peaks is right around the corner. Whether coming from lower elevation to hike a 14er, or needing to get our bodies ready to head up to 20,000 feet, about 6,000 meters, or even higher, let's talk about acclimatization, or adjusting to altitude. Hello everyone, I'm Jason. We're continuing our expedition planning series by getting into a subset, but an important subset, of expeditions. If we are going to change elevation a lot, we need to acclimatize. That is, adapt our bodies to handle the reduced oxygen we're going to take in at each breath. We are going to talk about what is going on in our bodies when we go to higher altitude, what the negative consequences could be if we acclimate poorly, and some basic tactics that support our body's abilities to acclimate well. I'm going to throw a lot of numbers and physiological explanations at you. So, I've provided links in the description if you want to read more. The issue at altitude comes because each breath we take in brings in fewer oxygen molecules. As a side note though, there actually isn't less oxygen at higher elevations, there's less air pressure, so the oxygen molecules are more spread out. How many fewer molecules? Compared to sea level, you'll get about 60% of the oxygen at 4,000 meters or 13,000 feet, just over 53% at 5,000 meters, about 16,500 feet, about 45% at 6,000 meters, around 20,000 feet, 41% at 7,000 meters or 23,000 feet, and 37% on the 8,000 meter peaks, those above 26,000 feet. Everest at 8,849 meters provides one third of the oxygen we would experience at sea level. But for us to talk about what to do to acclimate, and for it to make sense, we need to talk a bit about what is going on with our bodies. Let's start with oxygen saturation, the amount of oxygen we have attaching to our red blood cells. Normal blood oxygen saturation at sea level is near 100%. It's in the 90s in Denver, at just above 5,000 feet, around 1,500 meters, and somewhere in the 80s on top of a Colorado 14er, about 4,300 meters. And if we were at a sea level hospital and they saw blood oxygen saturation in the 80s, we'd be immediately admitted to the intensive care unit. But when we go climbing up high, we don't need to go to the ICU. So what's happening with our bodies to make that possible? Well, our bodies are compensating to get more oxygen to our cells and tissues. We will breathe faster and deeper to get more oxygen in. Our heart rate increases to push that oxygenated blood around faster. We will urinate more, and there's a multi-step reason. Our kidneys release a hormone that tells our bone marrow to produce more oxygen-carrying red blood cells. And to make room for these blood cells, we need to dump fluid from the blood. Some of that fluid, eventually, is released through our urine. Also, as a result of shedding that fluid, our blood actually gets thicker. Finally, the increased respiration means we breathe out more CO2. That decrease in CO2 results in our blood pH rising, that is, becoming less acidic. Here, again, our kidneys kick in and pull bicarbonate from the blood to balance the pH level. So, what happens when things don't go well? The result of poor acclimatization can range from headache to acute mountain sickness to pulmonary edema to cerebral edema. While the mechanism for altitude-induced headache is unclear, Current theories hypothesize that the dilation of blood vessels in the brain, in an attempt to widen them so that more oxygen can get in, may play a role. This can be exacerbated by dehydration, the combination of more active urination, increased respiration, which also releases water vapor, and the less humid air at altitude can all lead to dehydration. Dehydration, in turn, impacts kidney function, and if our kidneys aren't operating optimally, we are impacting blood flow the production of more oxygen-carrying red blood cells, and the balancing of electrolytes and management of our blood's pH. Kidneys play such a role that I think of food as the fuel I give my body to provide the energy to get up a mountain, while I think of water as the fuel I give my body for acclimating to our increasing heights. Acute mountain sickness, or AMS, can include symptoms like worsening headache, nausea and vomiting, fatigue, dizziness, 
tunnel vision, slurred speech, and memory loss. Anyone want to climb while dizzy, tired, having trouble seeing, unable to communicate, unable to remember landmarkers, or while getting dehydrated even faster due to vomiting? And likelihood of AMS is not correlated with fitness. It can strike the fit and the unfit. It can strike those who have been to altitude before or newbies to the heights. Later in his life, Sir Edmund Hillary, yes, one of the first two summiters of Everest, along with Tenzing Norgay, could not go above 14,000 feet due to persistent AMS. Sometimes uberfit people who climb too high too fast to acclimate well can increase their risk of getting AMS, and higher exertion levels mean less oxygen saturation of the blood, which increases AMS risk again. To combat AMS, stop ascending, at the least, or head down. We can simulate heading down by going on oxygen. We can combat mild symptoms with ibuprofen or acetaminophen. Acetazolamide, also known as Diamox, increases respiration and may speed up acclimatization. For moderate to severe cases, dexamethasone can reduce brain swelling and the resulting symptoms. AMS symptoms can also worsen into more immediately life-threatening issues, one of which is pulmonary edema. Edema, or swelling, in this case is in our lungs, and is linked to higher blood pressure in the lungs, with small blood vessels unable to cope with the pressure and thus leaking fluid into the air sacs. This, of course, makes our lungs kind of waterlogged, impacting their ability to bring in oxygen, which only creates a vicious cycle with even more hypoxia, or oxygen starvation. This, in turn, increases the shedding of fluid, and the symptoms get worse with the potential for respiratory failure. Very rapid resting heart rate, chest pains, blue skin or lips, and crackling in the lungs are all indications of HAPE, or high-altitude pulmonary edema. A vasodilator, like nifedipine, may help, but we don't have conclusive results yet. Oxygen intake and descent are the most reliable treatments. And then there is cerebral edema, or swelling of the brain. High-altitude cerebral edema, or HACE, can progress very rapidly, and also typically results in massive loss of coordination, sensory loss, and loss of executive function. You can see how getting down with HACE may be an impossibility. Altitude illnesses can happen as low as 5,000 to 6,000 feet, or 1,500 to 1,800 meters. Colorado surveys done in some of our many 3,000-meter ski resorts suggest between 15 and 40% of those sleeping above 8,000 feet get some form of AMS. HAPE often sets in two to four days after arriving at altitude, and symptoms come on gradually. HACE typically happens at altitudes at or above 4,000 meters. Given the severity of HAPE and HACE, a governing strategy is to catch any symptoms of AMS and use that as an indicator to stop ascending or to descend so that conditions don't worsen. And another rule of thumb is that if we experience AMS symptoms and are at altitude, we should assume it is AMS, not food poisoning or the flu or whatever. Act as if so that it doesn't become, again, something worse. All right, that's all the bad stuff that can happen, but how can we be sensible and tilt the odds of good acclimatization in our favor? Well, staying hydrated is important. I set an alarm and try to drink some water every 30 minutes. But the big ticket item is our rate of ascent. Our body starts its physiological adaptations at around 5,000 feet, or 1,500 meters, in altitude. And it takes one to three days for our body to adjust to a new altitude. So for those living near sea level, be aware that acclimatization often starts in town before we ever get to the mountain. Once above about 2,500 meters or 8,000 feet in elevation, current recommendations are to not sleep at a point higher than about 600 meters or 2,000 feet above our last night. That sometimes isn't practical based on other objective hazards of a mountain, but we should be aware of how much, and if, we are stretching that practice. Can we manage modest altitude changes by either trekking into the base of our mountain to keep our elevation gains modest, or if traveling more rapidly, by stringing together nights spent in town, at the trailhead or base camp, in an intermediate camp, and then finally, two higher camps? If we live at or near higher altitudes, we can pre-acclimatize by following something like the above protocol several times before we ever head to our real objective. If that is an option for us, it can prove invaluable. Because while it takes days at an altitude to develop all the new red blood cells for that altitude, 
it takes months for those cells to die off. So stacking several altitude progressions together, even if a week apart each time, can slowly help us accumulate more red blood cells. For those who don't live near higher altitude, but who have the financial means, there is a gathering body of evidence that hypoxic tents, either purchased or rented and inserted into your home, can be effective by producing progressively lower oxygen environments while we sleep. Some guided trips now also provide hypoxic tent rentals and then plan an itinerary that shortens the trip duration, assuming people arrive to the trip pre-acclimatized. Whatever our process, we should listen to our bodies. If those headaches or other AMS symptoms kick in, even two hours at a lower elevation or with more oxygen has been shown to make a big difference. Do you have any additional acclimatization strategies that have worked for you? Let us know in the comments. Thanks for watching this video. Please like, subscribe, and share if you want to support us. For more information, you can go to our website at www.shortguysbetaworks.com. If you are going high, then you may also be going cold, so you can check out a video on some tips for staying warm in a cold camp, or you can check out our entire cold weather series, appropriately enough, called Cold. We'll see you next week, and keep on getting more out of that big outside.